awesome to be here this morning and uh, to share all this with you and to be a beneficiary of all this wonderful knowledge. Uh, that was a great intro and summary of everything I'm going to say, Ron. Um, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> we're, we're good. Uh, so anyway, when, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you uh, kind of, we've kind of touched around what happens uh, on how the GI tract uh, kind of interplays in, in all these different talks. Well, today we're going to go down into it. And uh, so you're going to get a real good visual of what's happening in the GI tract and what we need to do and why you need to do certain things to influence it. Um, and I'm going to start out with the definition of epicenter. And epicenter is a focal point as of activity, the focal point of usually a harmful, a harmful event, phenomena, and the center. And when I think of the word, I immediately envision an earthquake. An earthquake produces catastrophic consequences from an invisible event. And let's try. Let's try this one instead. There we go. Um, these Im images are from an earthquake that occurred in Japan, uh, which I'm, I'm sure you know all about this. <laughs> Um, probably is a source for a lot of your patients who need IVC, um, which had a magnitude of 6.8. It was about 231 miles northeast of Tokyo in March of 2011. Produced tsunamis uh, with 30-foot waves and uh, created considerable damage, particularly to nuclear reactors. And I chose the word epicenter to emphasize the importance of the GI tract in the genesis and perpetuation perpetuation of chronic disease. As in this photo, and this one, fire is a consequence of the destruction from an earthquake. Likewise, inflammation is a consequence of intestinal injury for the rest of uh, the body, creating chronic illness. And one of the main issues is, is this issue of inflammation. Uh, inflammation comes from the word inflammare, which is to kindle or to set on fire. And it is the body's, uh, it, there's a yin and yang to inflammation. Um, the initial uh, acute effect of the body's healing response of inflammation is to help deal with injury and infection. So there's that place for it. But when inflammation continues without any sp specific purpose, then it systemically will produce chronic illness. So with this, this uh, cartoon, um, I want to show you what is going on with the, in the GI tract. You've got your epithelial layer, which separates the outer world from our bodies. Uh, you have microbial components, bacteria that are kind of moving through here. We've got secretory IgA that's trying to help keep things under control. But when you get damage to the lining here from a variety of sources, diet, um, and as I learned uh, two days ago, uh, iron is such an effective uh, injurious agent, you make an opening for antigens, uh, food particles, and uh, other microbial components that can migrate through and contact, come in contact with these dendritic cells or apical presenting cells. These then take the antigen and they stimulate the innate immune system, which are these uh, cells that are in the lamina propria of the cells. These cells then travel throughout the body. They go up to the liver uh, and they uh, communicate with Cooper cells in the liver and also to the brain where they interact with microglia cells and they kind of set up shop there. And then these guys, they come back down into the in the intestinal tract, all uh, primed and everything for additional exposure. Now, the next thing that these guys do is they generate these uh, cytokines that we've been hearing about for two days, uh, IL, uh, interleukin-8, 6, and TNF-alpha. And then these come back up to the intestinal cell and create injury to the tight junctions. And this... Uh, creates more cell damage, and you get this cell-perpetuating cycle that goes here. You get more of these antigens going down, stimulating the 
the cells and the immune system and going back, feeding back, and again, creating more damage. So a cycle keeps repeating itself until we can interfere with that. It's just a representation of the apical cell with antigen stimulation, and it's then carrying it to the gut-associated lymphoid system, uh, which uh, these cells then, as I mentioned, produce cytokines that uh, perpetuate the inflammation. Um, this is a schematic that was from 1987 of uh, the uh, concept of intestinal permeability and antigens from uh, diet, either gluten, casein coming through, being recognized by the immune system, anti antibodies being performed, formed, and combining with antigens, uh, which create these complexes that can settle into joints, creating arthritis. Uh, the other uh, mechanism that was talked about was antigens coming through and antibodies being performed and molecular mimicry being set into motion where you've got antibodies that are primed against these antigens but they get confused when they're circulating around the body and anything that kind of looks similar in structure, the antibodies will attack and that creates inflammation in the joints. So that's another mechanism that was floating around. But over the last couple of days, we've heard a little bit about LPS, lipopolysaccharide. This is really a very important molecule uh, in inflammation. In the 19th century, uh, it was uh, recognized as a very powerful uh, stimulus to this inflammatory cascade, um, and it was sort of particularly identified in the uh, pathophysiology of sepsis. Um, no, it didn't just, doesn't just contribute just to sepsis. It uh, really sets off inflammation everywhere in the body. And over the past 15 years, we've been having a lot of uh, uh, work to clarify the structure and its uh, pathophysiology. Um, LPS is a, uh, it's an endotoxin of uh, gram-negative bacteria. Uh, it actually performs a function for the bacteria to protect it from bile salt digestion. Um, and when you keep in mind that gram-negative bacteria comprise about 50 to 70 percent of our microflora, we have a lot of this running around in there. So there has to be a system to help protect us from the lethal effects of this, bac of this uh, protein. Um, and that is uh, accomplished by our tight junctions. They prevent access of it into the bloodstream. So when you have intestinal permeability from injury to those intestinal cells, LPS can then enter. And when it hits the bloodstream, it can produce a violent inflammatory response. This is what this guy kind of looks like. You've got this toxic protein, uh, uh, lipid moiety, uh, lipid A, and it's covalently bound to this core polysaccharide. Um, and this is the path that it takes uh, when it gains access uh, into, the, into the intestinal lining um, and into the bloodstream. It, there it is represented there. It's picked up by this lipoprotein binding protein. It's carried to the uh, immune cells where it then binds with these uh, molecular complex which has this toll-like receptor 4. You may see that if, when you read about these mechanisms. Toll-like receptor 4 is a very uh, significant player in that. And that initiates this intracellular signaling of transcription, genetic transcription that is uh, mediated by this NF kappa B, nuclear factor kappa B, and that sets into motion these genes that then produce the cytokines. So, tight junctions. These are the guys that are uh, regulating, uh, well, protecting us from uh, LPS and a variety of other noxious uh, stimulants from pathogens and things, but it's also a very significant regulator of intestinal permeability and, and the movement of fluids and things in our, through our intestinal uh, lining. So this is a uh, picture of the, uh, the, the uh, intestinal cell, the enterocytes, and these are the proteins that comprise the tight junction. Um, you've got uh, claudins and occludins, and, and these go from the extracellular space into the cell where they attach to zonulin. You may have heard of zonulin. Um, <coughs> Fasano uh, has done a tremendous amount of work to identify these proteins uh, 
and uh, to really bring credence, attention, appropriate attention to the idea uh, of leaky gut that was a non-accepted term for a long, long time. Now it seems to be a very common mainstream, mainstream term. Uh, but these are the guys that are responsible for leaky gut. Um, so these onulin proteins then connect to the uh, cytoskeleton of the scaffold in the, within the cell that determines the permeability of uh, different things coming through. You have uh, sugars and proteins and fats that all are involved in complicated uh, channels and processes that mediate their movement through the cell, but it's water, ions, and solutes that go between the cells in this paracellular space that is uh, determined by these tight junctions. Uh, these additional proteins, adherence junctions, and the desmosomes are very important for as a strong adhesive to hold the cells together, but all that permeability is kind of controlled up here at the apical portion of these cells. So uh, the intestinal epithelial cells are sealed together by these complexes. Um, as I was saying, they create this uh, paracellular permeability uh, barrier, and it's damage to these. This is, this is our little epicenter, by the way the tight junctions and, and what's happening here. So damage to this area is what increases that permeability that, that leads to uh, the inflammation, uh, the movement of the LPS into the, into the bloodstream. Um, and the pathophysiologic events that can trigger that are there's, you know, different, obviously different uh, infectious pathogens, uh, but uh, more uh, commonly we're identifying significant food factors that can do that. Uh, sugar is a huge issue. I'm going to touch on sugar again in a little bit. Um, but other proteins like uh, uh, gliadin uh, from gluten um, uh, can, in susceptible individuals uh, can be a very significant player. Um, and then cytokines themselves have uh, a role in creating this damage. And uh, we've identified numerous cytokines that uh, and their role in this, interferon uh, alpha, TNF alpha, and then these different interleukins. And the pharmaceutical industry has been very active and very interested in these uh, cytokines uh, in trying to control inflammation. So we're, all of you, I'm certain, are familiar with um, all these drugs, Remicade, Humira, you see them all over the TV. Um, and they are uh, aimed at dealing with TNF-alpha and interfering with this inflammatory cascade at that level. And I've followed this path over, you know, the past 30-some years until I came to the fork in the road. <laughs> and uh, so I figured, you know, there's, there's got to be another road. This is just, this is just isn't really great. Uh, you know, medicines would come on the market, you know, and you start using them, and then all of a sudden people are dying, and they take them off the market. And uh, so it, it, it was getting very frustrating. And so I became very open to uh, other approaches. And I've looked at a lot of different things and was interested in, uh, in, in the blue zone concept uh, caught my eye. Um, and I, if you're not familiar with blue zones, they are the world's, uh, where the world's healthiest and longest living people thrive. Um, these are areas where the proportion of 90 to 100 year olds compared to the overall population is very high. Um, a Dr. Michael Poulin, of, uh, who is a Belgian demographer, traveled to these regions in an effort to substantiate the claims of longevity of these, uh, of these populations. And um, he created a, a longevity index, and he took a map, and he circled these areas on the map with blue ink, and consequently, they were called blue zones. I thought there was something else going to be like, you know, blue air, there was blue area, there was blue water or something. No, no, it's ink circumscribed areas on a map. Anyway, so I thought that was kind of fun. Um, and then uh, Dan Butner, who's written a lot about, uh, he's gone to these areas and really studied these populations. And his key takeaways <coughs> are that longevity is influenced by genetics by 25% and lifestyle by 75%. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's, uh, in, in his book, he talks about this interconnectivity as a key component to these cultures. He's uh, found that there are nine, power of nine are uh, nine lessons that are a cross-cultural 
distillation of the world's best practices in longevity. So taking lessons from the blue zones, uh, I realized that interconnectivity is something we were not practicing in our relationship with our own intestinal tract, particularly with um, what should be our friends in the microbiome. In an effort to eliminate disease and suffering, modern medicine has focused on infection and the germ theory uh, with the notion that a good bug is a dead bug. And as I follow this fork in the road, I arrived at the microbiome. And what any good talk on microbiome has to include a picture of Eli Mechnikov. Uh, he's a Russian-born biologist who won the Nobel Prize in 1908, um, and he made the direct link between human longevity and a healthy balance of bacteria in the body, confirming that death begins in the gut. He also said that good bacteria must outnumber the bad. Um, he's considered the father of immunology and the probiotic movement, um, and through his study of Bulgarian peasants, uh, he found uh, that their consumption of fermented prod products uh, contributed to their good health. He believed that aging was caused by toxic bacteria in the gut and that lactic acid um, would prolong life. Uh, therefore, um, he was a very strong proponent of uh, fermented foods. And he actually coined the term probiotic to describe beneficial bacteria. So definitions are, are always helpful. The microbiome is the sum total of the approximately 100 trillion live organisms, and that includes bacteria, viruses, and carolindine yeast uh, that exist on all body surfaces. I was paying attention during all these. Yeah. <laughs> um, gut microbiota are the gut microbiota, which uh, formerly had been referred to gut flora, still are, is the name given to the population of microbes that live in our human GI tract. Uh, probiotic are defined viable microorganisms, uh, sufficient amounts of which reach the intestine in an active state and thus exert a positive health effects. A prebiotic is a, defined as a non-digestible food ingredient that beneficially affects the host by selectively stimulating the growth and activity of one or a limited number of bacteria in the colon and improves host health. Symbiotic is a combination of both. Um, this is a, uh, a picture of a uh, handout that I use uh, almost with every patient. I love this because it, it gives a great visual of what a healthy intestine looks like, and I show them this is probably what yours looks like. Um, and it, uh, and then I, you know, I can tell them about probiotics and extol the virtues of how all those little squiggles can inhibit the ability of these toxic pathogens to attach and invade the lining. It also prevents the accumulation of yeast, um, and that and that works out very well. Um, this slide also uh, is also pointing out that um, bacterial cells are anywhere from three to one to ten to one to our human cells in our in our gut. There are unique uh, genes um, and the genetic uh, material of the bacteria to ours is about a hundred to one. So there's a significant interplay of genetic uh, uh, communication going on there. And this can also be modified by diet. Well, the good thing is that uh, this microbiome can be modified by diet and lifestyle. The Human Microbiome Project uh, <clears throat> was uh, started in 2008, and Ron alluded to this a little bit ago. It was started by the NIH, and it's a coordinated effort to characterize our microbiome. Um, it's identifying microbial communities in different parts of our body, not just the GI tract. Um, and this is from information gathered from thousands of individuals. <clears throat> so um, we are not just, uh, the, you know, it just points out uh, the um, amount of uh, micro material compared to ours is uh, by a factor of 10 and uh, that we are not just the sum of our parts. And all this microbial information, genetic information combined with our information um, makes us somewhat of a, uh, a supra-organism. I love that. 
Um, this is the way the, uh, the mapping of the microbiome. Um, you've got the different phyla in the middle here, and then these different rings are associated with, uh, with different parts of different areas in the body, so gut and stool ring here. And these are just showing the relative abundance of these different bacteria at these different locations. So there's gut, cheeks, uh, tooth plaque, um, that Dr. Levy has uh, been emphasizing um, for the past few days, uh, tongue, nose, um, and so this is a great thing. Um, it's actually helping to acquaint us with the diversity of the bacteria, and also it's leading to the point that um, health conditions uh, can be influenced by specific microbiota. Um, <clears throat> Ala Collins has made the point that uh, illness is not strictly a manifestation of our genetic flaws or our organ systems wearing down, but it's also a disregard for our uh, microbes, part of that interconnectivity um, dysfunction that we have. Um, so I mentioned uh, there are several mechanisms uh, in the lumen of the intestine by which the microbiome uh, is beneficial to us, but they also, their genetic information also is communicating with ours. And uh, this has uh, been studied in a couple other different um, life forms. Uh, zebrafish, uh, their intestinal flora can alter the expression of 212 genes, and that regulates epithelial proliferation, nutrient metabolism, and their innate immunity. Uh, germ-free mice have also been studied, and their gut flora can impact 267 genes. Um, there's dietary crosstalk that's going on as well. Um, our microbiome influences our intestinal cells through dietary interaction, and in particular, um, the uh, interaction with these short-chain fatty acids um, are generated from our microbes digesting uh, uh, these uh, starch uh, sugars that are coming through and generate uh, the appropriate uh, fatty acids. I'll talk about that a little later. Um, and these uh, can definitely influence by uh, probiotics and by uh, the prebiotics that we uh, put into our system, into our GI tract. All right, so as you know, when we are in the fetal state, it's a sterile state. and so when we come out into the world, that is our first exposure to um, the bacteria, and that makes a big difference. Um, how we enter the world really is going to affect uh, how we are going to uh, uh, survive uh, for our, our lives. And so the issues that can influence that are gestational length, mode of delivery, feeding practices, whether we're exposed to antibiotics, birth order, and these negative influences to these um, will have uh, lifelong impacts. So in taking this a little closer, um, gestational length, uh, or, <clears throat> so 11% of all live births are preterm. Um, and when you compare these uh, infants' um, microbiome to uh, full term, you see uh, striking differences. Uh, lactobacilli and bifidobacteria are absent or low in a lot of these uh, preterm babies. Um, and they also tend to have an increase in potential pathogens. When I was uh, working in the NICU uh, as a resident fellow, uh, C. difficile was um, uh, identifiable in about 2% of babies, C. C. difficile toxin. Um, and so uh, that certainly is uh, probably, probably why. Uh, mode of delivery is very important. 31% uh, of births in the U.S. are by C-section. That's probably really good for Dr. Riordan project. Um, little, little joke. Um, uh, infants uh, born by C-section, they have, it's, it's not good for, so good for the babies though, um, they have lower gut flora diversity, um, their microbiome uh, profiles are, are altered, um, and as you can, it, it makes sense because uh, in a vaginal delivery, you're getting exposed to vaginal bacteria and other bacteria that may be down in that location. Um, and particularly lactobacillus, and this leads to a normal introduction of these microbes. And when you're born by C-section, you're coming through the skin, and uh, 
This is going to expose you to more staph and other skin-related bacteria. As we've seen from the human biome map, there is a very distinct difference in those bacteria. So the long-term sequelae from this, uh, children born by C-section uh, have uh, had more problems with this atopic triad. They have more atopic dermatitis, rhinitis, and asthma. Um, and a meta-analysis also showed that uh, the incidence of type 1 diabetes was also increased by about 20 percent um, in C-section babies. Um, breastfeeding uh, compared to formula feeding also promote, uh, has seen a significant difference. Um, you have higher counts of your lactobacilli and bifidobacterium in your breastfed babies, plus a huge, huge factor is um, these, uh, the breast milk oligosaccharides. Um, these are prebiotics for these babies. And as I mentioned a little bit ago, prebiotics and what we take in definitely influences that microbiome. And actually, they're recognizing that these breast milk oligosaccharides are so important that they're actually adding them to different medical foods now that we can take uh, as adults to help improve our, um, our microbiomes. Uh, formula feeding um, also has other uh, significant gut barrier uh, issues, and, and I think uh, here it was kind of generically stated in this slide, uh, but I think um, from what Dr. Levy was pointing out with the iron additives, that that may be playing a very significant role in, in that process, so we can do something about that too. Um, so formula-fed infants are at a higher risk for uh, also atopic dermatitis. So if you're a C-section baby and you're getting formula, you're really looking for trouble. Um, pediatric uh, inflammatory bowel disease uh, seems to be uh, more of an issue for some of these babies, uh, type 2 diabetes and obesity. Um, the Human Microbiome Project is um, able to map out and fingerprint certain diseases. This is kind of, this is a example. Uh, this is what a uh, control microbiome um, might, would re resembles, and uh, those with Crohn's disease uh, have this picture. You can see there's a distinctly different pattern, and ulcerative colitis uh, has a, a distinctive pattern as well. So there's, this, this may be something we'll be able to use uh, in the future. Um, so, obviously, we know that these that um, uh, changes in the microbiome are, are associated with various problems, and there's more and more papers now that are substantiating this um, with autoimmune diseases and cancer and obesity, um, and also brain function. And there's more. More uh, as the volume of literature keeps expanding on the association between uh, this uh, abnormal dysfunctional microbiome and, uh, and our chronic disease. It, it's just becoming more and more apparent. So I do want to talk about obesity. Um, I don't, you, know, you all know that obesity epidemic is, is, not, is not new to anybody. Unfortunately, despite our increased attention to this problem with uh, the plethora of books, supplements, uh, television info commercials, and White House efforts, the epidemic continues to escalate. Worldwide, the number of overweight, overweight and obese people has increased from 857 million in 1982 to 2.1 billion in 2013. And in the U.S., uh, these just graphically also imprint this, uh, there were about eight states in 1985 that reported 10 to 14 percent of adults who were obese. By 1995, 15 percent of the population was considered obese. And then by 2010, um, you have uh, 36 states that have uh, obesity rates that are up to 30 percent or higher. Now, two out of three adults are considered obese. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's pretty striking. Um, obesity is, is not just gaining weight. It, it actually is an inflammatory disease, and the recognition of this idea that obesity is an inflammatory disease uh, certainly gives explanation as uh, clarity to why uh, the ideology of why we have all these other consequences of obesity. And one of the main <clears throat> one of the main factors involved with this is um, the creation of visceral fat. Um, 
visceral fat is responsible for uh, increased pro-inflammatory cytokines. Again, uh, CRP comes up in our conversation. Um, and uh, visceral fat activates signaling molecules that interfere with normal hormone dynamics. Uh, the fat becomes inflamed and retains these inflammatory white blood cells. And this um, also is really uh, significant uh, when you consider that in the gut, when you get those lipoprotein uh, polysaccharides hitting the, uh, hitting the bloodstream and getting and interacting with this uh, fat, how it's kind of an incendiary device triggering more inflammation in all these different sites. So uh, it kind of gets back to, well, where's this visceral fat coming from? And that visceral fat is uh, related to the whole um, insulin insensitivity idea. And that whole process, as you know, when you have excessive glucose constantly um, bathing your system, your cells are constantly bombarded by insulin. And as it's continually exposed to insulin, those cells turn off to insulin, so they be, those receptors become insensitive. And therefore, you have more sugar running around your system. Pancreas is generating more insulin. And insulin, as an anabolic hormone, encourages cellular growth. It promotes more fat formation and retention uh, and storage of excess glucose, um, which also stimulates more inflammation. The cycle keeps going around. So what, what else could be going on to contribute this, and how does that relate to our epicenter? Well, in your intestinal tract, we have two uh, significant phylum of bacteria. Greater than 90% of our gut microbiome is uh, dominated by the, this phylum firmicutes and bacteroidetes. Um, firmicutes have uh, the um, attributes of extracting calories from food, and so that contributes to increased absorption of calories. Um, and then the other thing that firmicutes do is they exhibit this genetic crosstalk that I talked about that controls genes that adversely impact metabolism. So the influence of these firmicutes on the DNA is to make the body think it needs more calories. Um, when they looked at children in rural Africa who eat predominantly a high uh, plant-based diet, high fiber plant-based diet, um, and then compared their genetic microbes to that of Western diet uh, of European children, they found that the Western diet had, all, those kids had a lot more of these firmicutes compared to the, to the African kids. Um, the, uh, one of the attributes of the Bacteroides bacteria is that they um, specialize in breaking down bulky plant starches and fibers into uh, the short chain fatty acids or the uh, SCFAs that the body actually uses for energy. It's a primary source for enterocytes, actually. So um, the current thinking is that having more of these guys is much better than these. Um, and if uh, any of you use uh, some of the stool testing um, they, uh, uh, programs, they uh, have a section on the short chain fatty acids. And so looking at that, paying attention to that um, is something that you can do for your patients. Okay. Um, so there is compelling evidence that supports the concept that the gut microbiome participates in the development of fat insulin resistance, and low-grade inflammation. Um, <clears throat> and this uh, schematic also shows that when you have changes in your gut microbiota, uh, you can get injury to the uh, intestinal cells, which can be seen by if you looked at these proteins associated with the tight junctions they are altered. Um, this is allowing uh, that LPS to enter the bloodstream, creating endotoxemia. And that contributes to increased inflammation and further decreasing insulin sensitivity. So the whole thing is, is together. Um, diabetes uh, certainly is a huge issue that's been escalating in 1994. The map looked like that. In, in 2009, 
suddenly there's this explosion in patient people who are running around with diabetes. So um, David Permeter in his book Brain Maker uh, just comes out and makes a statement, ground zero for all things mood related is the gut. And uh, his part of his reason for making that statement is that if you now that we can measure um, lipoprotein polysaccharide antibodies in the blood, we find them elevated in patients with Alzheimer's disease. They're, they're about three times elevated over the rest of the population. Um, in addition, um, LPS uh, it also is shown to be um, to deplete um, the the brain hormone um, BDNF, um, <clears throat> and uh, and is clearly an inflammatory disease. Um, LPS has also been elevated in uh, ALS, depression, Parkinson's, uh, as well as um, uh, ADHD. Depression is a very significant problem, uh, and there are about – I'm going to tell you all about that. It's a very significant problem in that about 350 million people worldwide are affected by depression. Um, by 2005, anti-depression uh, medications uh, were the number one class of drugs in the country. Um, so, and also you can see that depression is very common in people with inflammatory illnesses and autoimmune disorders like irritable bowel syndrome, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, insulin resistance, obesity, all have increased inflammatory markers and gut permeability. About 80 years ago, the scientific literature suggested that a basic etiologic factor or a toxic condition existed in the GI tract, but this path was not followed by the pharmaceutical industry as they took over with their SSRIs that only treat symptoms and really don't get to the etiology of depression. Um, <clears throat> David Permeyer also points out that not only does LPS impact the, uh, the intestinal lining and uh, penetrate through to the bloodstream, but it also penetrates the blood-brain barrier, which allows other inflammatory um, chemicals to bombard the brain. Similar features of this inflammation are also seen in anxiety disorders. Um, the role of diet in depression has also been uh, studied significantly, and sugar has uh, been really identified as a, a huge issue. Um, it actually sets up this whole inflammatory microbiome. Uh, fructose is notorious as an uh, instigator of this. It increases LPS antibodies by 40%. Um, and when you consider that high fructose corn syrup is present in about 42% of all caloric sweeteners, you can see why we have such a huge problem with depression in our society. Um, there is a role for the microbiome. Uh, there was actually a study where they gave um, uh, a, a group of patients uh, probiotics, and then they did studies of brain activity, and they saw that the brain was responding to the, uh, to the guts of these patients. So, there is going to be uh, manipulations that we can make in our gut bacteria and our diet that will probably improve mental health much better than uh, what the pharmaceutical industry is uh, giving us now. So ADHD and Tourette syndrome, um, uh, there's, um, if you measure GABA levels, uh, they are found to be decreased. Uh, GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. Um, that's uh, very important in these, uh, these syndromes. Um, uh, glutamate is converted to GABA, and it's dependent on cofactors of zinc and B6. Lactobacillus and bifidobacterium uh, actually utilize these cofactors to produce GABA. So again, the importance of the microbiome in contributing to um, uh, neurologic uh, control of these illnesses. Other uh, gut-related symptoms in these illness, illnesses include constipation and caprices in, in kids. In particular, I see a lot of ADHD kids in my practice because of and caprices. 
Um, and then there's gut, gut sensitivity and food intolerance as well. Autism um, uh, has uh, been found to have a significant inflammatory component. It, uh, patients with autism have been known to have high levels of LPS, which uh, are probably directly related to intestinal permeability. People have talked about uh, leaky gut in autism kids for a long, long time. Uh, Dr. Wakefield actually found um, uh, that lymphoc lymphocytic abnormalities in the ileum of patients on uh, colonoscopy. So we know that there's this association there. Um, so the way that our gut also influences brain disease is through its production of these different brain chemicals. A minute ago I talked about a BDNF, which is this brain-derived neurotropic factor, critical for brain growth, neurogenesis, and protecting existing neurons. Um, it's uh, especially important in the prevention of dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Again, controlling LPS so that it uh, doesn't interfere with this is uh, probably something we need to be um, really very aware of as this uh, continues to be a scourge on us. Um, GABA, I just talked about that. It actually calms nerve activity uh, and ameliorates anxiety. Uh, glutamate neurotransmitter contributes to normal brain function. Um, this is also influenced by our gut microbiome. So uh, there's different things that destruct, di disturb, uh, uh, actually uh, destroy the microbiome. And uh, we've kind of touched on how diet contributes to that. Um, uh, antibiotics, chronic stress and anxiety does it through elevating cortisol, uh, which can increase gut permeability, um, increase pro-inflammatory cytokines that are generated by different uh, stimulus, uh, and then uh, uh, tryptophan also um, uh, depletion by various me methods um, can be detected, uh, especially you, if you find in the urine uh, elevated levels of canurinine and that uh, suggests that your tryptophan isn't being processed properly um, and uh, can result uh, in also microbiome dis disruption. So antibiotic therapy, I think uh, we all know um, early uh, exposure is going to uh, significantly alter, alter that, uh, those beneficial bacteria. Um, the long-term consequences of this um, also, you know, it can contribute to food allergy, this atopic triad, dermatitis, rhinitis, and asthma. Um, it also can contribute to um, inflammatory bowel disease, irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, it may have a role in uh, aggravating uh, susceptibility to celiac disease and early childhood obesity. Uh, different antibiotics have different effects. Obviously, there are antibiotics that have more broad-spectrum activity than others. Um, macrolide antibiotics are uh, uh, erythromycin, azithromycin. Um, the uh, ZPAC is, seems to have much more detrimental effect than uh, augmentin. So we need to be careful about when it's appropriate to use which, which, uh, which antibiotic. Uh, steroids uh, will adversely affect our gut health. Uh, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents, chlorinated water, also, this is uh, really probably uh, uh, should be on everybody's attention. Food production practices, so subtherapeutic antibiotics, well, what are those? Those are the antibiotics that are given to all the, all the food we eat, all the animals we eat. And the reason why they're there is the um, uh, livestock industry found that, you know, if they use these antibiotics, that the animals grow quicker, bigger. Um, unfortunately, they have lasting effects that can impact our microbiomes too. Obviously, pesticides can be detrimental to our good bacteria, and stress is in bold and whatever because that is a huge issue as well. Um, it's a whole nother talk on how to deal with that. Um, this slide's here just to remind me to tell you that you know as we get older, um, this is uh, gastric acid secretion that that falls. So when we get into our 50s, 60s, we have a significant deficiency in acid in our stomachs, and that's important from a couple of, uh, for a couple of reasons. One, um, it inf influences the bacteria that make its way down into our intestinal tract, and it also influences how we can absorb and digest vitamins in our diet. If you don't have the acid there, you're not going to um, liberate them and make them bioavailable. Um, so not only is it 
just normal aging for people who can avoid getting an acid suppressing medication, but all those people that are exposed to the um, proton pump inhibitors are definitely at risk for having a uh, disturbed microbiome. So you want to get off of those things. More importantly, you know, these things have been handed out like candy. And, uh, and then people, doctors put patients on these things and, you know, they don't really, they're not careful about saying, you know, we need to do this for a couple weeks and we need to decide if it's really benefiting you or not, and then taking steps to determine is it appropriate or not. So make patients aware that uh, if they're on these things that it, it's not a, a beneficial thing. And they have to do it carefully. High-fat diets also have been known and, and identified to alter the gut microbiome um, significantly. So I mentioned how prebiotic fiber will support our probiotic community, or, or actually support our probiotic bacteria to help our microbiome community. Um, we kind of uh, went over these things, I think. Um, stressing again, uh, babies who are born by C-section have a lot of issues they, they need to address. Um, and this slide really is to re to, for me to tell you that all probiotics are not equal. Um, and um, there are some probiotics that are receiving uh, scrutiny and are being uh, monitored and tested for their um, specific uh, healing attributes and contribution to our health. Um, and so uh, it's important as we go along that we pay attention to what probiotics we're using. Um, I, um, when I, I, I have a certain uh, battery of probiotics that I actually recommend for my patients because I know the company that makes them, I know their quality controls, and I have confidence in them. Um, and so I do, and I tell patients, you know, these are the ones I know. There's lots out there who I don't know, and if you want to do those, okay. But this is what I recommend, and most people respond really well to that. So our, uh, and, and with this theme of are all probiotics alike, I'm going to ask you a question here, um, and, and, and raise another question. Is strain significant? Is the strain of the probiotic, is all, you know, oh, lactobacillus, lactobacillus? Maybe. All right, well, so... Uh, before I go to hit the wrong button there. Um, if you go out to, to purchase a Canis lupus, Canis lupus is uh, a, 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 the dog family, okay, genus and species, um, would you bring home a Canis lupus albus, a Canis lupus familiaris, or would you bring home a Canis lupus labradorius? How many of you would bring home a Canis lupus albus? Nobody? Come on, you guys. Uh, how about the familiaris? There's a couple of hands. How about the Labradorius? <laughs> okay, let's see what we got. All right, so this is the, the Albus. Okay, so you're right. Nobody wanted th this wolf. That wouldn't be good for our little, little Bobby to play with. Uh, here's Lupus a a Labradorius, which is the Labrador wolf. And this is Familiaris. So, so I, I love doing that. So um, pre prebiotics. So it's on, now I want to get to what, what are the what what is you know why are what are the specific things that we can do? So in looking at prebi prebiotics, they are the fuel for a microbiome, and 30 grams of bacteria can be generated out of 100 grams of the specific carbohydrate. This is not general carbohydrate. These are non-absorbable carbohydrates. Um, they must be, uh, as mentioned here, non-digestible. So that takes fructose out of the, 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 the game plan here. They have to be fermented in, by intestinal bacteria, and then they will confer these health benefits. They'll reduce febrile illnesses. They reduce inflammation in irritable bowel, in inflammatory bowel disease and cardiovascular disease. They promote satiety. So you're less hunger if you're, you're getting appropriate pro prebiotics. And they also reduce glycation. I didn't mention glycation. Glycation, uh, advanced glycation end products, AGEs. These are um, the result of excessive glucose circulating in the bloodstream that combine with proteins and fats. And these are really bad actors, and they're particularly bad in the uh, CNS. Um, and contributing to uh, probably Alzheimer's uh, disease as well. So you may hear about AGEs um, or read about it. 
but these will help reduce that. Um, so church chain fatty acids, I wanted to get back to them. These are what are generated when you give adequate prebiotics, and your probiotics work on the prebiotics, and then they generate these short chain fatty acids. And there's three basic, basic groups. There's acetic acid, butyric acid, and propionic acid. Butyric is uh, particularly um, important because it provides uh, energy for our enterocytes and encourages uh, their, their ad, uh, optimal function. Um, acetic acid and butyric are both very beneficial. You want a little less of the propionic acid, and I think it's real interesting that when they looked at uh, short-chain fatty acids in different patient populations, um, pretty consistently the autistic population has a much higher um, uh, percentage of these propionic acids, way over these other two. Um, and so influencing that, I think, will, may also help uh, these patients. Uh, so what are sources of uh, foods that can contribute to uh, the short-chain fatty acids? Um, vinegar, uh, fermented foods, kimchi, cheese, um, dandelion greens are great, uh, kombucha. Um, and then these short-chain fatty acids, they help regulate sodium and water absorption. They enhance absorption of minerals and calcium. They lower our intestinal pH, um, and they enhance our immune function. And they do that because of their crosstalk mechanisms. They influence receptor site signaling, uh, interacting with these G proteins on the gut mucosa. Uh, they signal across the mucosa. Um, and they have all these great effects, and they reduce the fat accumulation. So something I really want you to uh, you know, take home with that. Then getting back to our epicenter, uh, we want to do things that are going to really help protect our tight junctions. And uh, so foods uh, are, you know, are really important. Glutamine seems to be uh, very helpful in uh, helping repair those tight junctions. Tryptophan, uh, we talked about fatty acids, and here are those short-chain fatty acids again that really will benefit the health of these guys. Uh, vitamins A and D. Um, uh, polyphenols, probiotics, uh, uh, medical foods in, in individuals who have significant uh, inflammatory and dis, uh, dysbiosis going on can have a role here. Um, polyphenols, um, I wanted to just point them out real quick. Um, they are metabolites in the plant kingdom. They are very strong anti-oxidants. They also have anti-cancer uh, properties. Uh, they're different, two different classes, flavonoids, uh, quercetin. Uh, they will enhance barrier integrity, which is affecting that positive effect on those tight junctions. Uh, curcuminoids are also uh, part of this, uh, which are very beneficial. Um, another, uh, I, I want to just introduce this uh, this, this uh, concept here, this SBI stands for serum bovine immunoglobulin. And what these are, these are cow immunoglobulins that have been um, uh, uh, processed out of uh, cow serum and uh, put into a powder form. And you can take them orally, and they have uh, the beneficial effects of working in the lumen of the intestine to try to help uh, stop the uh, process, this, this uh, enteritis, this enteropathy cycle that's going. So we talked about this in the very beginning of my little talk, um, and these are supposed to help uh, and do help interfere with that. They do this by uh, binding these microbial components, and by binding, then they don't allow them to uh, permeate uh, through the enterocytes to get down to those uh, Cells. So it blocks the, um, the whole cycle. That whole stimulus to cytokine production gets blocked. And that's why it's been very, very helpful. Um, the, there's a specific product. Uh, it's called Interagam. And they're actually responsible for these slides. So I do want to give them uh, some acknowledgment for letting me use these. But I feel that this is a very powerful way to help interfere with this process and to get the healing process going. They also actually uh, promote um, the production of uh, this uh, anti-inflammatory cytokine IL-10. Okay. Um, 
this is just another, another slide that shows how this potentially can improve uh, the health of the enterocytes and improve the tight junction function. So there's nothing better than a good video to really cement a, uh, a concept. So I've got this to share with you. And let's see if I can't get this going. Oh, no. OK, here we go. We're going to do this. Specific intestinal disorders like irritable bowel syndrome or inflammatory bowel disease cause a cycle of events resulting in the breakdown of the intestinal gut barrier. This can lead to abdominal discomfort, bloating, flatulence, urgency, and loose frequent stools. By stopping this destructive cycle, the mucosa is able to repair, strengthen, and heal. There are four layers to the gut barrier. Each layer has a unique structure and contribution to barrier function. The microbiota, which serves as a microbial barrier, aids digestion and captures antigen in the lumen. The thin mucus layer contains proteins and defense factors that serve as a chemical barrier. The epithelium serves as a physical barrier while supporting nutrient absorption. And finally, the gut-associated lymphoid tissue in the lamina propria forms the immunological barrier. If antigen penetrates the other three barriers, this tissue activates an immune response to limit damage to the epithelium. One of the most essential structures for barrier function are the tight junctions near the apex of the epithelial cells, which regulate the flow of fluid and salts. Each tight junction is a dynamic complex of more than 50 proteins that spans the epithelial cell walls. Outside the cell, the exposed loops of claudin and occludin proteins interact with loops of adjacent cells. Inside the cell, zonulin family proteins anchor the complex to the belt-like apical rings of the cytoskeleton. Contractions of these actomyosin rings tighten the gaps between cells and seal out damaging substances, including microbial components from the intestinal lumen, and keep the intestine's immune system in check. Cell signaling controls how the tight junctions form and remodel in response to different stimuli, part of the gut's natural process to maintain the barrier. Studies have shown that bacterial toxins and other stressors disrupt the integrity of the mucosal barrier. Conversely, epithelial healing and decreased inflammation correlates with tight junction repair. When inflammation subsides, tight junction repair occurs through the body's natural processes, Digestive health and good nutrition depend on gut barrier function. If the destructive cycle of intestinal enteropathy can be broken, normal physiology of barrier function can help re-establish the mucosa and restore intestinal homeostasis. Gut barrier function is the key. Okay. So I hope that that will stick in your mind for a little while um, and that uh, you kind of understood this first time I saw this thing I was kind of blown away but uh, so that's why I preface showing you this uh, this video by kind of explaining the structures involved this uh, these represent the the product uh, of the serum bovine immunoglobulin and you can see how they bind up the toxins so that they can't penetrate into the lower levels of the intestinal tract setting off that whole inflammatory cascade and I found in clinical practice that this has been very helpful for acutely getting my patients under control, and then I get them into their probiotics and their prebiotics, and hopefully they'll live happily ever after. So my takeaway message is, is pay attention to our microbiome, um, and uh, you know, design your uh, advice with, with the idea of helping, always going after that with whatever else you're treating, Make sure you're paying attention to how everybody, how your patients are dealing with their intestinal tract. You want to ensure the integrity of the gut lining um, by recognizing and then treating intestinal permeability. And then our future treatments for chronic disease, I believe, are going to these are these are all going to have an increasing uh, and uh, permanent role in our therapies. What probiotics we use, that is going to change over time as we become more knowledgeable about what specific probiotics are amenable to specific uh, problems. Uh, we'll probably be fine-tuning our prebiotics. 
Um, and another uh, thing that we, I really didn't talk about, but worm therapy may also be introduced into our armamentarium in dealing with, uh, with various intestinal issues. Also, um, there probably will be a role for continued antibiotics, but the whole uh, thrust of antibiotic use has got to go to more narrow spectrum, not wider spectrum. That's gotten us into a tremendous amount of trouble. So with that, just leave you with this. Blue zone, heading toward the blue zones. Uh, no man's an island. We can't make it alone. We need our microbes. Thank you. Very good, Tom. Uh, well, I have a quick question for you while I'm changing the computer. Two questions, actually, and then could all of you write down your questions? We can't take them right now, but we'll do questions at, from four to five today. But uh, number one, everyone's moving towards the uh, ketogenic diet, and that's a very high-fat diet. Is that going to be more disruptive than it is good? And number two, any great ideas for SIBO? as because so many people are coming in with uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Okay. Uh, so in addressing your first question with the ketogenic diet, I think it's uh, anything to get away from sugar is probably a very uh, a, a optimal move. Um, you know, we do need, like I said, uh, these prebiotics, appropriate prebiotics, are not absorbable sugars, so that is not in any way um, inconsistent with doing a ketogenic diet. So I, th I think that that's a, 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 a really great idea. Um, the other uh, issue uh, that you meant about SIBO, question about SIBO, um, I think that uh, you know anything we can do to, we, we have to address that. Having bacteria up in the small intestine is not helpful because you're gonna be digesting uh, sugars that we need um, early, too early, and they're not getting absorbed appropriately. So they're uh, creating uh, havoc up there, creating gas, discomfort, and all these symptoms. So we do need to address that. Um, and a couple ways to do that are uh, by altering uh, the bacteria. If we need to suppress some in order to, in order to clear that out, that's good. I think that uh, using the serum bovine immunoglobulin to bind them up is probably a really good way to approach that. Um, but I address that all the time in my office. Uh, uh, on you know anybody who walks in with uh, irritable bowel kind of symptoms, that's one of the first things I have to deal with: is do they have SIBO or not? Yeah. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you, Tom.